Welcome to another episode of the Verbal Echo Podcast. Today I have John E. Olson. He was raised, born and raised in the Cache Valley, Utah. Parents still own the old farmhouse built in the mid-1880s. At eight, he began to realize that his home was peculiar. Strange experiences such as phantom knocks, loud boots running up the stairs, missing objects became commonplace for him. With each run-in, with what he called the man in the hat, John's interest in the paranormal grew. His parents didn't want him telling anyone about his experience for fear of what others in the small community would think. Fast forward 25 years, he spent interviewing and documenting firsthand accounts of those who've witnessed all kinds of strange and unusual phenomena in the Western US. He now has a series of books that he's gonna tell us about uh, with firsthand accounts of everything from ghosts, monsters, and hauntings to glitches in the matrix, Sasquatch, and UFOs. Let's do this. I'm so excited. <laughs> Welcome, John. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on. This is this is a blast. Thank you. Oh, I love this. And I just, I have to say, I just got back from Phenomicon, and it's so awesome that I'm having you here just a couple of days after getting back because this is going to be great. <laughs> awesome. So, awesome. yeah. So I guess maybe just start with your history, like growing up and what happened? Yeah. So the the home I grew up in, like you mentioned, it was built in 1883. So um, when I was a kid, it was a hundred years old and, you know, it didn't take long for me. I have an older sister and a younger brother and it wasn't long before the three of us were like, Hey, you know, there's things that happen in our house that don't happen in other people's houses. Um, it's an old farmhouse, uh, that was built and it, it was interesting because, you know, it happened so much from when I was a little kid that, you know, by the time I was a teenager and stuff, it, it didn't scare me. It mostly just really fascinated me. And so, you know, I had all kinds of experiences like um, when we were little kids, we called it the stair monster because the main thing that happened all the time were um, either kids footsteps running up and down the steep stairs that went up to our room or heavy, heavy boots you could hear going up and down. And so we kind of called it the stair monster when we were little. And from there, you know, we had all kinds of experiences and only when I became, you know, when I got older that my parents finally admitted that they had experiences at the same time, because when we were kids, they wouldn't admit there was anything going on and they didn't want to scare us. They, my dad was adamant that nobody thought our house was haunted and only to find out he was having experiences too. So it really got me interested in the paranormal. And so I studied everything I could when I was young. I also have ADHD. So I became very hyper-focused on that, on learning everything I could. And it all just fascinated me, not just ghosts, but, you know, Bigfoot and UFOs and all different kinds of things. So, you know, it really got me studying about it. And then eventually, by the time I was a teenager, I had friends who had experiences in my house and they would be like, what, what's going on? And I had to admit, I'm like, yeah, I grew up in a haunted house. And so at parties or when we were all on double dates, they would ask me to tell stories. So I would. And before long, I had a few people coming to me, telling me their story. And then I started hunting down the stories, you know, because it was important. It's always been important for me to get it firsthand because there's a ton of stories of this happened to my brother's uncle's cousin. And at the time back, back in the day, you know, it was a lot of footwork because, you know, you had to hunt down the person that it happened to. Now it's a lot easier because with my website and my books, people come to me, you know, just automatically, which is kind of nice, but there are still ones that I, that I hunt down when I hear, but yeah, so it, it kind of grew with me collecting a bunch of stories. And then about nine years ago, um, I, I remarried about nine years ago and my wife, um, you know, she, she kind of saw all my stuff, my papers and everything. She's like, what are you doing? And I said, well, I, you know, I explained to her everything, what I did, how I got here with all those stories. And she's like, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I want to write a book someday. And she goes, why don't you do it now? And she was, 
so awesome in helping me not only with the first book, but all of these. And once I wrote the first one, which was Stranger Bridgerland, which is now what the series is called, um, it kind of cascaded and I've been able to write a book a year since then. Um, just about every year. Well, every year since then, I've written, been able to put out a book. So it's been a lot of fun. And where did the podcast uh, start? Was it after the first book? Yeah. Well, it, it's been um, a couple of years ago. My wife and I started that. And um, we're, we're on a hiatus right now, just with a few things going on. Um, and, but we're hoping to get that back up and going again. But yeah, it started with, you know, just um, saying, hey, let's do a podcast and we'll just talk about it. Because it, one thing that my wife has pointed out um, is that I'm full of all of this information and all the stuff that I've looked up and found and everything. And I just assume people know this stuff. And she's like, no, people don't know this. And so she's great to have on it too, because she doesn't study anything before and we'll pick a topic and I'll just talk about, you know, the things that, that we're learning about that week or the things that we're talking about where that part of the paranormal and she's great because she doesn't have, you know, that same background. She kind of comes from the everyday kind of background. So um, she's able to ask questions that, that hopefully the, the listeners have as well. So it's, it's been kind of fun to do that way. Yeah. That's a great perspective to have that other side. Like you might think you can explain it, but she's like, what does this mean? What, what is this? And so then it makes you kind of go down that rabbit hole of explaining something like, you know, not everybody. I just had a conversation today and he was like, what's a skinwalker? I'm like, oh my God, you don't know what a skinwalker is. Like, <laughs> yeah. but, but to me, you know, that's my community. Those are my people. So right. it goes without saying that I know what that is, but someone else might be like, what are you talking about? What, what is this? I had someone refer to me as, uh, oh, you're hanging out with all your weirdo friends. I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> yes. I got exactly. some weirdo friends. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, 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 and I'm, the yeah. <laughs> and and I'm the type of person that if I hear something new that I've never heard about, um, a week later, I'll have everything learned that could possibly be known because I'm just like, I've got to know everything about that. And so I walk around with this knowledge in my head that I, I sometimes, like I said, I, I assume other people know. And my wife's like, no, people don't know that or yeah. people don't know that story or, you know, so it's kind of fun to do when we do the podcast to to do that, talk about the strange and unusual things that aren't normal or common, I guess. Right. What a, what a great support team your wife must be. <laughs> she really is. Yeah, yeah. She's amazing. So, and, and really inspired you to, um, to, to, to gather all those stories and to put them out. So how did you collect the stories to begin with? You said you had, was it a blog or what did you have the form or so originally I started collecting when I was 17. So this is a million years ago. Um, and at the time, I, again, it was like just when people would bring me their story or they would say, hey, I heard this story from my uncles, blah, blah, blah. And, and it would take me quite a while to hunt down the people and get them to tell me their story. And so I could document it. And that's how it went for a long time. Um, again, until like my first book came out. Um, and then I, you know, built my website, had that up. I've got my email and all my information in the books. Um, I started doing other people's podcasts at the time as well um, and radio shows. And so since that first one's come out, it's been a whole lot easier because, you know, people will come to me and um, or, or like, for example, my last book was Stranger Utah. And so I already had a ton of stories because I'm here in Utah, but I kind of put a call out to all of my friends on like Facebook and I'm like, Hey, this is my next book. If you guys have any strange stories or know anybody, let me know. And some of the cooler stories I got in my last book came from friends who said, Oh, my, my, my father-in-law or my, you know, my buddy, whoever has this amazing story, you've got to get it. And, and then I'm able to connect with them and, through a zoom or, or, you know, a call. So, yeah. But, yeah. And, and you live in the high strangeness area. I mean, Utah yeah. is, whoo, you're not really in the, you went to basin. No. Um, 
it looks like you're north of that, but um, yeah, it's pretty strange. I even witnessed some strange things when I was out there um, oh, over the really? weekend. Cool. It's like, oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> it's so cool. I'm like, I love this stuff. The whole hitchhiker, um, uh, I don't even know what to call it. Phenomena kind of scares me, but mm -hmm. nothing's happened yet. So I don't know, <laughs> but it was yeah. really cool. Those, yeah. those are really cool stories. Yeah. And um, I think, you know, it's so funny because when I talk to people about the paranormal, they'll kind of like roll their eyes and then they'll go, well, you know, there's this one time. <laughs> <laughs> they're like yeah. tell me more yeah, yeah. It, it, i think people there there has been such a stigma about it that no one has wanted to a lot of people i don't want to say no one but a lot of people they just don't want to talk about it but everyone right. has a story yeah everyone i haven't met one person i just found out a couple of weeks ago i was flipping through some old documents um that my grandmother had written um she lived in texas she had written about where she grew up and she literally wrote down in her family history, like summary about how there were strange lights that no one could explain. And this happened. And this was back in the, um, I think I want to say it was back in, in the, in the late, like in the thirties, 1930s. Mm -hmm. And the whole town was talking about it and no one understood it. And, and, and it just was just like, just like a little paragraph that was in this, um, family history thing. And I thought, oh my gosh, my grandmother was an experiencer and how I would, and if I had known that as a kid, I would have been, you know, standing right next to her, like writing things down and probing her and asking her questions. But I think that's so typical because people just don't share it because they don't feel safe or they think, oh, right. you know, people think I'm crazy or whatever. Yeah. So. Yep. And, and, you know, I think with a lot of stuff that's going on, people are becoming more comfortable sharing. Um, when I gather a story, I am more than willing to change somebody's name and kind of be vague on locations just to keep their anonymity. But I, more and more, I'm finding people are okay with, you know, with telling their name and all of this. So. Yeah. And people come forward with, um, you know, they're, they're very well respected. You know, you've got people in law enforcement, you've got vets, people in military, uh, doctors, uh, it's just, it's, and then you everyday folks, you know, mm -hmm. um, it, it's across the board. And I think having a way to share those stories and bring them together into a collection is such a great way, um, to do that. So, yeah. yeah so what are, so what are the names of your books? So the first one, there's eight of them now I have eight. So the first one uh, that's going to put me on the spot. So I need to see if I've got a good memory. So the first one is stranger Bridgerland. Um, then beyond Stranger Bridgerland, Stranger West, and they all kind of get a little bit further and further apart, you know, as I went, because I gathered more stories. So there was Stranger West, there was Stranger US, Beyond Stranger US, uh, Stranger Paranormal, Stranger World, and then the last one, I, I came back to the state of Utah, and I'm I'm going to try and, and go state by state, because I have quite a few enough almost enough in each like utah idaho wyoming where i'm close to get a whole book out of it so it, it should be very interesting so that's kind of because once i did world i was like my my wife is like where are you gonna go from there and i'm, I'm not sure because like and i am still getting stories from all over the world so eventually i've got to go back to the world but mm -hmm. those are my books right now so that's awesome i've thought about doing one on colorado just because i'm from here um mm -hmm. and i yeah, I think the just putting it out there and saying, "Hey, just send me your stories," you know, yeah. um, and not really putting a uh, a specific topic on it, like cryptids or ghosts right. or whatever. Just saying, "What is it?" Like, tell me your weirdo story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Change your name if you want to. Just <laughs> tell me your weirdo story. And right, yeah, right, yeah. So. What? Well, so, out of all of your eight books, which kudos, that's really impressive <laughs> <laughs> thank you um what do you think is some of the weirdest if you could share one of the weirdest stories so the, one of the ones that i always pick out um is it goes back to the fact that when i started this even when i was a kid and i started collecting stories something that i i never thought i would get was 
an honest to goodness fae story, something with a small creature like that. Because, you know, even in my ignorance back then, I'm like, oh, that's just fairy tale stuff. And, and even though it's very rare, I do get them. And when I get them, they're just amazing and, and fascinating. In uh, Stranger, Stranger World, um, I interviewed, actually, I interviewed this woman through her daughter because she didn't speak English, but um, her daughter had heard me on a show or something and, and contacted me and wanted, to sh wanted her mother to share it. She grew up in a small town in Mexico and um, they lived in a, a little farm out in the middle of nowhere and they had to walk to school on the dirt road and she had several older brothers and sisters, but the one that was the closest, I believe his name was Diego. I'm not 100% sure. She fought with him all the time. They fought all the time. They were only a year apart. And one day at school, they got caught like physically fighting at school. And the teacher made them stay after to do chores. And they were walking home from school and it's later. And they get in a fight again on the way home. And her brother runs off and leaves her. And she's just walking up the dirt road out in the middle of nowhere to get home. And she gets hit by this, by a dirt clod um, that came out of the brush. And she's like, she's like, it, it must be my brother. He waited so he could throw it at me. She runs off and, and jumps into the brush, grabs a rock and jumps into the brush. And it's not her brother. It's this little man that has like, dirty overalls and just crazy black hair and a beard and he's got another dirt clod and ready to throw at her and he says you leave diego alone that's my person that's my person and then takes off into the brush and he's like really little like not even maybe three feet tall maybe not very tall at all and she freaks out and she runs home crying and tells her mother and her mother explains to her about duendes, which are small people, creatures that live near farms and that will attach to a farm or to a person in some cases. And her mother's like, well, this, this duende feels that your brother is his person. And so we got to make this right. And so she writes a letter saying that she won't fight with Diego anymore and leaves it by the barn with some, some cookies that she made and milk. And she leaves those out for a couple weeks to make up with the Duende. And then she's never bothered again. But um, that it was just fascinating when I, when I, you know, interviewed her and everything. And then I dove into the folklore of the Duende and it's just like that the small little, little people that live, you know, out there. And like I say, and it's the same, what's fascinating here. And that I find in this is that, especially with the Fae, you have the same creatures all over the world doing the same thing, but with a different name from people's folklore. And when you think about it, it how is they, they weren't, you know, people back then didn't communicate way back, you know, in, in the time or, and so you just wonder where these stories come from. So it's very rare when I get one of those, but it's just, I love them. They're just fascinating and weird. That's it. Oh man, that's such a great story. And you, when you were telling that, I was thinking of, remember in Harry Potter, um, the little, now I can't remember his name. Dobby. Uh, Dobby. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking of Dobby, but maybe yeah. just a little bit littler. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's so, so weird. It is. Don't yeah. mess with my per. He was basically saying, this is my person. Don't mess yeah. with him. I'm here to protect him. Yeah. Yeah. Have you so. read, um, who is that author that has, um, he's from the UK and he's a well-known author on the Fae hmm. Kingdom. Um, and now I'm I have to look this up. Yeah, because, no, yeah. Because if um, I don't, I'm gonna definitely look it up and, and dive well, into it. So well, yeah. And if anyone's interested in it, like I think it's really worthwhile. So I'll continue to look this up. No, yeah. um I have it saved. And he's like, I, I think this person that wrote this is um he's well known in he, I think he was, he's a scholar. So he's like in academia and he wrote all these books on the fairy kingdom and the Fae. And um, he's just, you know, well-respected in that genre. 
and I am going to find this, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it's really interesting. Um, one thing you said earlier, you were talking about your parents and how you grew up in this house. And isn't it interesting that the parents, whenever you have a kid that has, is having encounters, it's always the parents that try to write it off as, yeah. Oh, he's got an imaginary friend, is he overactive imagination, something like that. But when you think about how open and receptive children are to this kind of thing, mm -hmm. and why don't we listen to their stories? Because I I was having experiences when I was a kid too. And I just never felt safe in talking about them. And yeah, and as you get older, I think you hear more from your friends about that sort of thing. Right. And, and yeah. And you're, you're kind of, when you're surrounded by people who have had experiences, you feel safe more, a lot more safe sharing them, which is part of why I'm, you know, I'm able to collect the stories I am because people know that I have had those experiences. And, and so it's, it's interesting that way. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I can't find that book. So <laughs> I don't okay. know. I'll see if I can post it in the show notes. And yeah, I will no find worries. it. Um, but when I was reading through your bio, uh, you said something, well, you, you mentioned some topics for your podcast, and I just want to read some of these off. And if any of these mm -hmm. you want to talk about, yeah. um, this one really caught my, this was like, I think it was like your first episode. It was about glitches in the matrix. And I was like, oh, and I just started trying to watch the matrix. What was the last one that came out? Oh uh, yeah. The one where they were a little bit older. It was only a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. It was a few years ago. It was yeah. not really as good. And I, right. I don't know. It, it was just different. And yeah. the acting was kind of bad. And I'm like, I can't watch this. The, I, <laughs> the first one is amazing. And then yeah. it just kind of goes off the rails a little bit after the it very does. first one. So yeah. Well, the last one, I, I don't know if I I'm thinking it probably didn't win a lot of rewards. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like the first, like the trilogy. Right. But yeah, so you said uh, you had a topic on glitches in the matrix, um, mm -hmm. missing persons, skinwalkers, Bigfoot, cryptids, native folklore, which I find really fascinating. And then a lot of Utah stuff yeah. and in the West. And what, as far as like native folklore, do you have any stories from either utah from um indigenous stories from the first peoples or anything like that um i do yeah um it's interesting that you mentioned that because not long ago um i met a gentleman um i i was this summer one of the things i love to do was my wife and i would go we have a fire pit out here we're way out in the country and we build a fire pit and put up the camera and just go on facebook live and just talk and tell stories and stuff and through that, I met a gentleman who does a podcast um, and he actually is Native American and lives on the, the reservation. And he came on and told some of the best stories of um, his um, uncle uh, was taking a group hunting and it was a two day ride back into where they were going to go hunting. And the first night they camped, um, he talked about uh, he woke up. And there was a whole bunch of little people, again, little people going through their stuff. And one of them saw him and walked over to him and, and said, you know, you didn't see anything. You don't, don't, don't tell anybody we're here. And if anything's missing, don't worry about it. And it was like really tough with him. And um, they're, they're, um, they're along the lines of, of what's called Pugwaji. That's what some of the natives call them is Pugwaji. Um and I used to know the name from the Shoshone out here and I should, can't remember it anymore. I just call him Pugwaji, but you know, it was fascinating because it was, um, I had, I had interviewed a gentleman who had had a run in with one of these creatures when he was camping, um, in an area here in Cash Valley, it's called, uh, Mount Naomi near May Mount Naomi. And, um, uh, he got woken up in the middle of the night. He was all alone. And this little thing was sitting on raw on a pile of rocks, throwing, you know, little rocks at him to get him up and to leave. And the, the little guy had stole his book that he'd been reading. Like he had a paperback book that he'd read before he fell asleep and he had just stolen it from him. And, um, and then, you know, I kind of thought of that as a one-off, but after I published that book, 
I had, I had three other people contact me saying either they had seen a creature like that in that area or their husband, one lady, um, her husband claims he had seen it and she thought he was crazy. And then she read my book and he's like, Oh my God. She's like, I believe you now because it was in this book too. But so, yeah. Um, so there's, a, I love those stories with the, the Pukwaji. Um, I have several um, stories that would fall under, uh, I guess what you would call skinwalkers as well. Um, uh, which in my latest book, uh, Stranger Utah, it's still one of my favorite stories because it, this gentleman that I interviewed was a, um, an archaeologist in the 70s who was working on a dig site, um, a Nanasazi dig site near the Four Corners. And um, when he, they kept getting run off at night by these big uh, balls of light, um, these globe balls of light that would basically chase them out if they were there too late. And then one night he was there late, everybody else had left and he could hear something walking around the, the dig area. And he felt really nervous and got more and more nervous. And so he left and he could hear something following him. And so he ran all the way to his car or his vehicle and drove out. And the next morning he went with the head archeologist back there um, because he told him what had happened. And so they both went in the morning to investigate and this is where it gets really interesting because they followed from his tracks that left the dig down to where they park there were enormous wolf tracks that had followed him down and what's really strange to begin with is there were no wolves uh, back in the 70s 80s i mean even now they're really rare in southern utah but they followed and the, this wolf had followed him down to his car and, and when he, when he'd left, it turned and started out through the sagebrush into the desert and they followed it. And as they, right before their eyes, they're following this wolf track, it transformed into a barefoot human track and continued on to the desert. Like they, you could see it transform. He was saying from a wolf to a bear human track. And he's trying to talk to the head archaeologist about this and he would not, would not talk about it. Did not want to say anything. Wouldn't verify it with anybody. He didn't want to talk about it, but from then on um, they were not allowed there until the sun had been up for an hour and they had to be out of there an hour before the sun went down. That was the new rule at the, at the dig site. So. Yeah. And that's a story that keeps getting repeated over and over again, the footprints that transform, mm -hmm. whether it's from one animal to another or a human footprint into an animal right. or, or vice versa. Yeah. And the wolf thing is interesting because as uh, many have heard, like Colorado has, is going through a wolf, a wolf reintroduction program right now. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we do have uh, gray wolves and they've, we have them in Montana and Wyoming and, you know, like they're, they're in the West. Um, but in the season five of Skinwalker Ranch, they find, have you seen that where they mm -hmm. find a wolf carcass? They take it to a biologist at, I can't remember the lab he's working University at. University of Utah. University of Utah. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, he can't, he can't really attribute it to a species that's alive today. We'll just yeah. leave it there. <laughs> it, it's, it's more, it more closely resembles the jaw of a uh, dire wolf, which has yep. been extinct for a long time. So. It's really strange. And so more, more, the morphology of it matches a dire wolf. Yeah. And they found the body in the, the river and they hauled yeah. the jawbone out, took it down to the lab. And I just find that so interesting because what was it? The Sherman family on the ranch, mm -hmm. uh, they, the, was it the first, I, I might be getting this wrong, but one of the families that took over the ranch, the first night they were there, they had a run in with a massive wolf and, uh, yeah, boy, it's just the phenomena well, that it's just, wow. What What's strange about that story. And I love that story too is it came in and was really friendly. The kids were petting it 
and everything, and it was enormous. Then it jumped the fence and grabbed one of the calves. Mm. So they grabbed a rifle and shot it, and they continued to shoot it with a rifle and a pistol, and it didn't even phase it. Just all you could see was fur, fur flying as they shot it. But it did, and then they followed it down into the riverbed where it disappeared. But no blood, no nothing. But they shot it, it left several flesh times. too. Yeah, it flesh, left flesh. Like they had flesh, flesh. Yeah. and of course they didn't know to take it as a sample at that time because they had yeah. no idea. Nowadays yeah. we'd be all over that. Yeah, with <laughs> yeah. specimen jars and everything. But yeah, that that story is just fascinating. I and I remember hearing this just a few days ago that they shot it quite a few times, like what you're saying, and it just sauntered away mm -hmm. yep <laughs> very scary <laughs> so weird oh yep. i love the weird <laughs> yep. and and i have several stories um, that i've collected of people who have had run-ins with wolves that were extremely large like larger much more um bigger than any wolf that is in utah or colorado or anything and one one woman explained she j got into her jeep just in time and the back of it was at the top of her car like her window of her jeep the back of the wolf was that tall as it went around her jeep um and so yeah it's really Where was scary. That, at? that was also near near the four corners um there's a place mm -hmm. there's a city called monticello down there in, mm -hmm. in utah and uh she worked in monticello at the time and she would take her Jeep and go do photography and go everywhere. And uh, this is back when she was in her twenties and she worked there. And, um, and yeah, one night she was just out taking pictures in the desert of the sunset in, in the, in the Canyon lands. And this thing showed up and just walked around her Jeep. And um, the thing, the two things that really stood out is the fact it was, it was jet black it was enormous. And she said when it growled, you could feel the vibration inside of the truck, like inside of the Jeep. You could feel the vibration of it growling as it went around her, her Jeep. So Damn. yeah, scary. It's, the four corners, it's not a nor. Yeah. I'm going to have to check into that. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it's not, too, well, it's kind of far from me, but right. um, it, there have been a lot of reports of the four corners area. Yeah. There and is. so I'm just wondering if there's another little thing going on down there. And I just wanted to say, isn't it always when you're out camping? Yeah. <laughs> Something always happens when you're out camping. It is. Yeah. Th that's where a lot of the stories that I get uh, come from. And that could be just the fact that, you know, I'm where I live. I, I'm like five minutes from the, the mountain. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of that that goes on. A lot of people um, who come here for the summer, it's hiking and camping. And so, right. Yep. Yeah, Utah has a lot of Utah, like Colorado. I think Colorado. I've lived in Colorado for a really long time, mm -hmm. and Utah is less populated. So I don't think there's as much. Um, I mean, yes, there's tourism and that sort of thing, um, yeah. but I don't think there's as as heavily touristy as Colorado has become, especially since like 2020. So many people moved here. Right. It's right. kind of ridiculous. And they're it's well, like, why go I, away? Yeah. I think it was because <laughs> of, I, if I'm not mistaken, I know that when, when you guys legalized marijuana and being the first state that, that made a huge jump. A lot of people moved just, um, they're like, well, I don't want to have to deal with that. So I'm yeah. going to go. So I, th I think that had a lot to do with it, but I don't. The green wave. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's possible too. Um, and, you know, I don't want to cast doubt on that because there no. are people that need it. And Oh, yeah. No, no. I'm not disparaging a... it. I'm just saying that, right. that had a lot to do with it. I know. Just talking yeah. to my friends in Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, and and again, like you like you mentioned, I remember reading a story about um, a, 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 vet, a vet who, because of the what he had, that was the only thing that, that would make him even semi-normal with everything oh, that right. was going on in his head. So he... he packed up and moved to Colorado when that happened, because then he could have a life. So yeah, right. it's not, it's one of There's those things. There's so. definitely um, a place for more research. Um, yeah. Like I knew a child that was cured from cancer. Oh, wow. From it. And I don't know the details of it. And yeah. 
don't take me i just remember it this was about uh 10 years ago or something um but yeah and so i mean i yeah <laughs> so i'm sure there yeah no i'm sure there was some of that people you know yeah. some of the population increase was due to that for sure mm -hmm. Um, and also like, you know, 2020, I think a lot of people jumped on that whole bandwagon of, I want to sell my house, um, in the city and I want to move to the mountains, Yeah, you know, and they thought, oh, it's going to be so wonderful. We're going to go skiing every day. And then they get here and like, oh, this kind yeah. of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you mean I have to work three jobs? <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> oh. So, and that's, you know. that's been kind of the reality for sure. Um, and so you also had a topic of like missing persons and it's interesting. Well, I was at, so I was just at this conference and I got to listen to a panel and also a private, uh, speech of David Polites and his missing 411, uh, research mm -hmm. and, um, really fascinating um, and then I watched the documentary the other night on the missing 411 and it was a lot of cases in Colorado. And I thought, wow, you know, he, and he, he made an impression on me as, you know, he's, he's law, he's like former law enforcement, um, investigative reporter. I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure exactly what his, I, I know he was in law enforcement and mm -hmm. when you meet him, he is down to business, just the facts. I don't want to hear a bunch of crap story uh, send me the facts right? And, and then I'll make my own, um, analysis and then I'll write about it. And I thought, wow, that's really refreshing. Um, that, yeah. that, you know, that he's, he's taking it seriously. He was very mm -hmm. serious. And so I think anything that he writes about and, or produces, or he's a part of like with all of those missing 411 documents, documentaries, I think you can take them at face value. Yeah. Yeah, I I have all of David's books. Um, I've actually been um, lucky enough to talk to him a couple times um, about. Um, I I came across some cases in Utah that I sent to him and was able to talk about. And um, it's it's funny that you mentioned that because I was doing some research two days ago um, about above me um on the mountain here there is what's called the witch tree it's the menden witch tree and there's a lot of folklore around the menden witch tree so i was doing some of the research for that because i was going to do an interview with a local um a local person um about the witch tree anyway but as i got into it um i found the case uh not very far from my house in fact that in um 1868 there was a family that owned a mill just below me here and um, their little girl went missing. She was two and a half. And as I read, like everything falls just perfectly like it does in David Pilates thing, because her and her brothers were in the front yard playing a storm hit out of nowhere. Everybody came running into the house except for her. She went missing. Her mom goes calls for her. Can't find her. They go get her dad from the mill. Somebody runs with the horse to the two nearest towns. They get a posse of all, you know, like as many men as they can look for two weeks, even dredged the, the canal that was the hand made canal near there. Everything like hand, you know, hand holding all the way across the fields through the everything. They never found even anything of her. She just disappeared. And later on, they they say they were pretty sure that maybe some of the native americans coming through had taken her but i think that was just them trying to reach out and find an explanation so um but i really thought it was fascinating i may even you know reach out to david and let him give him that information just because it falls all under what he talks about and um and it's probably the, the oldest one that i've that i've found of that and what was the year on that again? Um, 1868, I believe. I have to look mm. at my notes, but I believe it was right around then. It yeah. was some of the first people here in the Valley. And her name was Rosa, Rosa uh, Thorson, I believe, or Thor um, something hmm. like that. I, I've got it all in my notes, but yeah, it's, it's fascinating because like I said, I was searching more information on something else and just 
went down a rabbit hole, but then I goes, that happens to me all the time, to be honest. So, so easy to do with the stuff, <laughs> rabbit hole after rabbit hole after rabbit hole. And where do we end up? Yep. <laughs> um, exactly. You know, that that's, that's, you know, when you were speaking about this, I thought this was really interesting because I was remember, remembering those documentary that I just watched on the missing 411. And it was weird that they were all most, they were all children, I think. And then they would either find their bodies or, or they would find them or whatever, like way up a steep hillside or a mountainside or uh, the one boy that actually lived and he has no recollection and he walked like, what was it like 12 miles or something yeah, round yeah. trip? And then they found him, but he was like, what, two years old? Yeah. I don't, I have a really hard time understanding this because I raised three kids and I know that my two-year-olds would, would barely walk a quarter of a mile, <laughs> much less hike in flimsy boots around up a mountain yeah. for 12 miles. That makes no sense to me. I can't wrap my head around that. Yeah, no, there's so many things in that, that make no sense like that. Um, Another one, you know, right along those, there was a, a missing 41 hunters, which was, you know, directed at all these missing hunters. And the one that always sticks out to me is this gentleman that went missing and they did finally find his body like two years later, but it was way up at the toppest part of the peak where it was literally when he went missing, there was 12 feet of snow up there. Um, he could not have got there unless he was dropped or something of that nature. You know what I mean? But um, there's just a lot of things with that, that it's just so weird. Um, and for the most part, you know, um, he's kind of hinted, uh, David has that he believes it may be UFO related now, but at least at the very beginning, he kind of left it up to us to try and figure out exactly he what's did going say that. on but, i remember yeah. i remember we were um someone we there was a q a with a lot of these panels and someone stood up and said well what do you think it is and he said no 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 yeah. i give you the facts and the information you're smart you tell me what you think it is and i thought that was really interesting because um it was kind of refreshing to hear someone say I'm, I'm just delivering the facts. You make your own decision. It's not, it's, a, it's not up to me to tell you what I think it is because yeah. who knows? I wasn't there. Yeah. Right. Yep. And, yeah. and that's the thing is it's, it's such a mystery. It's so weird, but yet um, it's, it's a documented thing. Like you have search and rescue and the sheriff's department and the government who have all of these documents about it. And, you know, so it's not like you're, you're hearing, oh, you know, this happened to somebody or, you know, down the road, but this is, you know, real people who are going missing. And some of them are never found like, and it's weird. <laughs> it's so weird. Yeah. Even, even where I live, like at the ski resort, uh, we just had, I think it, I don't know how many winters ago, it might've only been like two winters ago, someone went missing. Uh, and I don't know if they found this person. I think maybe they did find him, but it was just in a, it was just really like a tourist, just out skiing, whatever, had a family, no reason to disappear, just took a wrong turn, I think. And then they found this guy in a really strange place. And it's like, what were you doing there? You know, yeah. like uh, he would have had to have like jumped ropes and gone down close. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know. And, and, it, and, you know, the ski resorts make it easy now because you have the app on your phone, it's GPS geolocated. You can pretty much see exactly where you're at. And honestly, I think the resorts do that for safety and yeah. liability because they can say, well, we have this app, we can give you a GPS location of exactly where you are. And it makes me wonder if they don't know where all the skiers are at all the time. Just because yeah. like if, well, and that's granted if you're using the app, but now with the, with the, uh, resort passes that you have in your pocket, I, I, I wonder if there's some kind of a GPS thing. Like, I, I mm -hmm. don't know. I mean, I don't know how that would be powered, but I mean, right. It's, if it's connected to your phone for sure, right. then you, yeah. they'll find you. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know. 
but yeah. from a liability standpoint, like a major resort, um, you know, it would, it would be in their best interest to, to know where all their guests were in case there was an emergency. Right. So, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it's still kind of happening with people. And so you just kind of shake your head, you know, wondering how, how this happened or how that happened. Yeah. What it's were you weird, thinking going so, down there? I mean, yeah. like, <laughs> well, yeah. and, and, and the kids are the ones that are so tragic, <laughs> uh, the missing yeah. kids. And that, um, that's what David covers in his books. Uh, mm. and I haven't read them, but, um, Highly recommend checking them out because it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, mine are on my bookshelf behind me and every one of them is just tattered because I've marked them up and read mm. them and, you know, tried to connect dots and, but yeah, so, and they yeah. are, and, and they're just basically the case, you know, the case reports of exactly what happened and you're just like scratching your head. Mm -hmm. so. Right. Yeah. So you're. So you're going to probably try to get your podcast up and running again. Um, yeah. Here start... shortly. Um, I'm hoping awesome. to get my podcast up and going again. My wife and I have a, we have a great time doing it. It's, it's just been kind of crazy lately, but um, yeah, yeah, we're going to definitely do that. So sometimes we have to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> and, but, but breaks are good because then you get motivated. You have, you get yeah. a chance to rest. You think, well, where am I going with this? And you have a chance to realign on what your, what, what, are, what your mission is, what your purpose is, what do you want to do? What do you want to say? Right. right. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. What is your message? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing all this. So where can we find your books? Yeah, you can find all my books on Amazon. Um, they're all on Kindle, softback, a few hardbacks, and then, um, also, um, audible as well. They're all on audible as well. So, uh, no matter how you like your books, you can find them out there. So, okay. And, so you got them on audible. Nice. Yep. And then that also is... you guys can reach me on my website, strangerbridgeland.com. If, if anybody out there has a story they want to share with me that I would, I love to hear from everybody. And so, or, or just let me know if you liked my books or if you didn't like my books, just reach out. I'd like to hear from you. Perfect. And if someone has a story they want to share with you, Yep. do they email you or yeah there... they email me and then we'll and then i'll get connected with you and do an interview so perfect all right yep. well thank you so much i hope everyone has enjoyed this episode i know i sure have it's been awesome thank you so much that hour flew by it does <laughs> <laughs> it's so much fun thank you so much john thanks